Good evening, if you're uh, joining us from the United States, and good morning to my panelists who are in uh, South Asia, in Sri Lanka and, and India at the moment. Uh, and welcome to our panel on the U.S. halfway through 2022 Uncertain Thrives. My name is Francis Shortkin. I'm a professor of international studies and national security at the University of Mount Union in the United States, and it's my distinct uh, pleasure to chair this uh, panel. Uh, now we have two uh, in, uh, two uh, very accomplished panelists. Uh, we're missing two additional ones, but that gives us a lot more time to uh, engage in uh, in what I'm sure is going to be a very substantive uh, discussion. So we have with us uh, Mr. Ranil Wik Wikram Singhi, a former Prime Minister of Sri Lanka. Welcome, sir. And Mr. Abhi Shah, uh, founder of Clutch Group. And welcome to you as well. Um, I will let each of the panelists introduce themselves in a little bit more detail as they uh, start their opening remarks. Um, what we are dealing with today, as our topic suggests, is uh, uncertainty and the, uh, the thriving of uncertainty. And uh, I think one of the ways to get that discussion started is, uh, if you allow me to quote the late Yogi Berra, who once said that it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Um, so we do have a situation right now where it seems that um, uncertainty is much more of a, uh, a problem these days, especially in the uh, 22 uh, election year, the midterm election year in the United States. And the uncertainty that sort of uh, hovers over that will not just have implications for the U.S., but it will also impinge on, on many other nations. And so what I uh, hope that we can discuss a little bit is what you see as some of the, the challenges, some of the uncertainties uh, that you might want to, uh, to predict, um, and then also engage in a discussion uh, if we have time for that on how leaders around the world, whether those be business leaders, political leaders, how we can guard against uh, unexpected outcomes if uh, that is really you know, possible. And if... Uh, if we look just at the world around us today, uh, by the time we sign up for this panel, and now a lot of things have changed. Some might have been expected. A lot of our things were truly unexpected, most notably the uh, conflict that we're seeing in, in Ukraine uh, right now. Um, so as we think about the uncertainty that is surrounding us, are there any outcomes, and I'll put this to our panelists to think about as well in, in their comments maybe. Are there any outcomes that uh, we might be able to sort of predict with a, some degree of maybe certainty? Um, or are you thinking that global unrest and volatility are just sort of the, the new norm um, and we just have to live with it and deal with uh, that kind of uncertainty as it happens? And uh, particularly, we want to spend some time on thinking about what risks do you see as sort of the uh, the ones that we should put uh, front and center in terms of our planning and risk mitigation, um, you know, strategies. So uh, with that, um, I would, uh, if I go by the order in our panel here, um, Mr. Abhi Shah, I would uh, I'd like to give you the floor. And again, you can introduce yourself and then uh, spend, uh, a, I'll give you about, five to seven minutes, or um, since we only have two panelists, we can be a little bit more flexible, uh, but definitely not beyond 10 minutes uh, so that we can have a, a back and forth discussion afterwards. And the way we do it is I, I go from uh, uh, from uh, Mr. Shah, uh, then to uh, Mr. Wickerme Singhe, and then we'll come back and have sort of a, a more interactive discussion. Hopefully some uh, um, other people will join us, uh, and then they, they might also ask questions. So without further ado... Uh, Mr. Abhi Shah, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Francis, uh, for um, kicking it off. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, and a board director, uh, the founder and former CEO of Inc. 5000 Listed Clutch Group, a global artificial intelligence powered data analytics firm. Um, I currently serve on the board of uh, AML Right Source, which is the largest global provider of financial crime solutions, and as the chairman of Yuva Unstoppable, which has transformed 2,500 impoverished municipal schools, impacting the lives of 1.25 million underprivileged children. 
uh, previously served on the boards of uh, BlackRock backed digital transformation provider, Sequoia Capital backed artificial intelligence software company, and was named Entrepreneur of the Year in 2015 by Ernst and Young. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you and Ronil. And um, like you rightly said, um, the uncertainty that thrives in the current times that we live in has already changed things, you know, in the past few months since we uh, accepted the invitation to speak here and today. The United States and the world are now facing a geopolitical shock of the Russia-Ukraine war while still recovering from the once-in-a-century pandemic. So, you know, Francis, in terms of the key risks, you know, that I see, I believe there are three that lead the pack. You know, first of all, inflation, is al- which, which already has been at a 40-year high in the U.S., um, you know, is at the risk of exacerbating due to the surging oil and commodity prices. You know, we've seen oil skyrocket, you know, over the course of the last couple of weeks. Um, and it's going to bring home the war a world away to America's dinner plates and gas tanks. Um, you know, there's there's gonna there's already pain at the pump. Uh, Russia being a top three oil producer, um, you know, Americans are already paying double for gasoline than they did early in the pandemic. Uh, food prices are on the rise. You know, planting and harvesting requires diesel. Farming and food processing is energy intensive, uh, and transporting it from the farm to shelves or any other product for that matter that is moved by truck, ship, or train requires fuel. Um, You know, if you look at daily items in the U.S., um, they get 90% of neon from Ukraine and 35% of palladium from Russia, uh, which is used in semiconductor production. And, And that is used in virtually everything from phones to computers to cars. Um, You know, so you have rising prices across the board with this risk of exacerbating inflation. And and as we well know, you know, that hits the poor and the vulnerable the most, um, you know, who don't participate in the rising asset prices. So I think the exacerbation of inflation is is one big risk, which is already at a 40 year high. I think the second uh, key risk is slowing of the growth and potentially even I might say a recession um, due to raising the interest rates to curb inflation. Uh, Plus, you know, consumers cutting their spending, uh, which is really two thirds of the US GDP, especially on non-essential items. So I think that is a key risk uh, and and sort of between a rock and a hard place, you know, in terms of what do you do with um, uh, interest rates and how aggressive uh, the Fed can be uh, because it risks Uh, slowing growth and and potentially a recession. And finally, you know, geopolitical risks, um, you know, especially with the current conflict, uh, potential rekindling of a Cold War, uh, you know, between U.S. and Russia, um, cyber warfare, uh, which uh, in some regards has already sort of started, or worse, you know, getting pulled into a military war with Russia to defend NATO members. If there is a, a... spillover, for example, to the Baltic nations, you know, beyond Ukraine. Uh, So there are uh, lots of uh, rapidly moving parts, uh, you know, to the evolving situation. And also, I think you risk emboldening the rising authoritarian superpower, China, to potentially, you know, move on Taiwan if Russia does not face severe consequences. So I think the current situation is going to test the mettle of our leaders worldwide. Um, And I, for one, am cautiously optimistic that that we can rise to the occasion to resolve the Russia-Ukraine conflict and reimagine and rebuild a better world post the pandemic, more peaceful, more resilient, more sustainable, and certainly more inclusive. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, so next, uh, Mr. Rani Rikramasinghe. Thank you, Francis. 
that was a quite interesting analysis by abhi and how do i introduce myself a member of parliament now one time prime minister when i started my politics in 1977 i was deputy minister of foreign affairs so i've always kept the interest in what happens in the outside world and i think this is a significant moment for global politics and economics i it, it's very very fluid both the political scenario and the economic scenario i i would look at three general issues first is the economy how is the global economy going to react we, we are just recovering from pandemic pandemic was has made a significant change in our economic thinking and how, what the future would be then you have to that uh, the uh, climate change issues now on that us took over try to take over leadership at glasgow but i think it's got shattered now after ukraine and the hard line so what do you do about global climate change that that's, that's a big issue thirdly the ukraine war impact on the economy russia is really a natural resource economy so as abbe pointed out in many areas the in, in, in impact that's going to take place again uh, remember on food there's another item the russians contribution to fertilizer production in the world which means in our part of the world there will be less uh, access to fertilizer so there will be lower food production that will impact on prices plus the fact that you may have to help some of the countries out in food production that that's certainly going to be a very large issue and also you mentioned about the uh, rest of the industry that depends on russian raw material then countries like sri lanka which depends on russian tourists and also ukraine tourists so all, all, all these are going to impact each the, the micro impact on different economies taken together can be a massive one and there's another 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 aspect that you've got to find that for the first time the dollar the international financial system has been politicized so there is all the talk in our part of the world can you depend on swift and if you are only if you are going to have certain the china centric economy will get a boost from this but india and others will have to have to look at other options maybe create other uh, asian uh, oriented systems can you replace swift i think mumbai has can do the reverse india can do the reverse engineering if they work with dubai uh, similarly uh, you you've got to look at london london has been thought to be a safe haven Tony Blair invited the Russian oligarchs in. Now, if you are going to sanction them and target them, that money is going to come into Asia, maybe to Dubai, maybe to some other place. But Russians are going to move out. And finally, who is going to uh, invest in Russia after this is over? They may not want all the Europeans back again. I think China and India will have a bigger say in the car market. In many areas, China, India. and uh, middle east funding will move it making the russian economy come closer to asia so those, those are some of the impacts and finally the war itself the war itself if you look at it russians will finally as it go, go, as it goes on now it where they will they, they will surround kiev and all they start negotiating they are not going to be a no fly zone and uh, they know after president biden's remarks on minor incursions that they can uh, certainly have, have their way here in uh, ukraine already the mid level officials of the us defense department and russia defense ministry have started communicating with each other which means there's going to be a shift and russia will have a security zone outside its boundaries that's 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 one uh, uh, secondly the there is a big shift of power from the west to asia the whole of asia is silent except for japan and uh, south korea some may have hit it by voting on the un resolution but that's just say the russia has invaded ukraine which all of us accept that the rest of south asia has just been silent and you find that china and india are playing an important role so with that and the fact that there can be more economic cloud coming into asia especially to dubai and india because russian will also not put their investments into one basket You, you you're finding that change and uh, finally uh, president putin 
is directly intervening in the ele midterm elections of US because at the end of it it will be a question of who lost Ukraine and president uh, former president Trump will say look I, 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 go, I had managed the whole thing under control at the moment the media goes on what's happening playing up the Ukraine president but remember this is going to be November and uh, someone need to start blaming the Democrats uh, what's happened. And this is not President uh, uh, Trump's election. It's President Biden who has to uh, defend this stuff. So things can go wrong. And this may be the most direct intervention that President Putin has made in the American elections. And if he succeeds in that, he can always recover his economy. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, well, I'm, I'm pleased to, uh, to welcome uh, Mr. Martin Attel uh, as well, uh, Chief Executive Officer of VoteBash. So welcome, sir. Um, I guess I'll uh, proceed and give you the floor right away so that you can uh, also introduce yourself in a little bit more detail if you would like, and then uh, provide uh, your initial thoughts. Um, we went for about five minutes each. Uh, so if you want to take uh, that amount of time, um, and then uh, once you have shared your thoughts, I might come back with uh, some of our questions and we, get, we jump into um, an interactive discussion. Uh, so, Mr. Attell, the floor is all yours. Yeah, thank you for having me and uh, absolutely uh, delighted uh, to see the other guests in this panel. Um, my name is Martin Attell. I'm the CEO of Vogue and we help organizations uh, with real-time feedback in the field, whether it's political or economical sense. And in that aspect, uh, we uh, are most interested in the temperature of, um, yeah, uh, the country's uh, citizens base and uh, consumer base. Um, and quite uh, exciting uh, to see uh, what's going to happen with the elections in 2022. We are going into the midterm elections, which is basically a test uh, for the Biden administration. Um, and now we see a lot of uh, dynamics uh, across the world. Um, and it will be very interesting to see how that is going to play out on the uh, U.S. Uh, election and beyond. Okay. Uh, in that sense, let me... Uh maybe follow up with some very, very brief remarks on my own. I think all of you have touched on very interesting and obviously very relevant uh, topics. Um, if I uh, sort of build on to what uh, Abi has uh, talked about to some extent, you know, the, uh, the reliance that we have seen in your context of discussing inflation uh, and possibly uh, shifting into, into a recession also, when you talked about how we are already reliant on the, uh, or being vulnerable right now because of the Ukraine crisis on uh, on certain inflows of uh, raw materials. Uh, so the, a, a broader question about uncertainty still might also be, and we have just come out of this, well, not fully come out of it, but the the, uh, the vulnerabilities in the global supply chains that COVID-19 has highlighted. So is the Ukraine crisis sort of you know, sig uh, signaling yet um, more of that uh, uh, vulnerability and what is going to be done uh, about this. But more importantly, from a, a social, economic and political point of view, uh, when you have a, a crisis like the one you can you have upwards of, I think it's more than a million people that have already left or are in a process of leaving. So you have a growing refugee flow where it has already been predicted that this would be the largest refugee crisis in Europe in the 21st uh, century. Uh, obviously, that will have implications for neighboring countries, the ones that might, uh, for humanitarian reasons, of course, uh, bring in uh, refugees, uh, whether that be um, you know, uh, a Poland that has opened the door or, or Germany. Uh, I think Romania or Bulgaria has also announced this and maybe the U.S. at, at some point uh, as well. So is, how do you foresee maybe the – is there going to be more social and political uncertainty uh, in terms of uh, a backlash that we might see in the countries whose leaders are now opening for humanitarian reasons their borders to refugees. Obviously, it's it's the morally ethical, it's the right thing to do. Um, but um, how is that going to transit? Is that going to add more uncertainty, at least from a political point of view? Do we see maybe the events that have shaped 
recent years or throughout the 21st century so far, um, do we see those events emboldening authoritarian leaders? Do we see that real resurgence of, um, you know, authoritarianism, illiberal leaders, um, and uh, what are the implications of that? We have seen, according to you know, some, uh, this type of illiberal democracy already in the United States. Um, and we have an election coming up. Uh, there are, there's uncertainty about what's happening there because of you know, what the narrative might be. And as some of you suggested, um, maybe the, the whole conflict over Ukraine is going to impact how people or how the election is being framed as to you know, who lost Ukraine. Uh, is it a result of um, how we pulled out of Afghanistan as well? So are there domestic implications and how do we guard against the domestic implications of those uh, external uncertainties or risk factors? Uh, I don't know if any of you have any thoughts on that. Um, I, I would invite to make the, open the floor to anyone. Um, or you can also piggyback on what other people have said. You don't necessarily have to just answer my questions, but you can also engage each other. So, I'm, I'm happy to start by commenting on it um, and then welcome my co-panelists to join in. Uh, you know, Francis, you bring up a very interesting point. Um, you know, with respect to the U.S., uh, with the visuals of Afghanistan and sort of the mess uh, that, you know, how things ended there, uh, you know, that's sort of fresh on mind um, in the U.S. And, and it being an election year, obviously, uh, there is more sensitivity around, you know, what kind of a role the U.S. plays this time. And, and that's why from the very beginning, I think the Biden administration has been clear that they're not going to send American troops, boots on the ground, you know, in Ukraine, um, given uh, how much longer um, the involvement ended up being in Afghanistan than anticipated by any of the administrations. And, and um, you know, what a mess it, it ended up being, you know, in the end. So I think, I think that is very much at play in terms of how they deal with Ukraine. At the same time, you know, you have um, sort of a democracy there, um, you know, that has uh, been uh, invaded here. And, um, you know, you have a leader and, 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 you know, all of these sort of innocent people trying to defend themselves, um, you know, which is a monumental task against the might of the uh, Russian military. And, and the world is sort of watching that. Right. And so it's going to be critical how crippling and effective the sanctions are going to be that the United States and, and you know, Europe and, and, and major countries in the world have sort of come together to effectuate. I think, um, you know, that that will have an impact on uh, both both sort of, you know, what the eventual outcome is, how quickly the situation gets resolved or not. Um, you know, and, and, and um, e effectively, um, you know, how America um, continues forward, both domestically from the fallout of this within the U.S. And, and in an election year, as well as sort of, you know, globally in its position as, as sort of the global uh, power, uh, particularly as the world order is slowly changing. You know, as Rani pointed out to sort of the rise of Asia, uh, you know, China, India, uh, and, and what the geopolitics of this ends up resulting. So I think it's, it's you know, very interesting times. Um, and America is trying to balance a, a very difficult situation, um, you know, which doesn't have an easy answer. Well, taking up from where Abe uh, left off, I, I would say that uh, the more effective the sanctions on Russia is going to have a bigger impact on the global economy because we are interconnected. Without the sanctions, then the West governments can't survive. And without the sanctions being effective, uh, the Western governments can't survive. And with the sanctions being effective and having economic crisis, survival becomes that much more difficult for the governments that are in power. 
The second one, as uh, Francis, you pointed out, are the uh, refugees. That there's already a million. There may be two million or more. How do you accommodate them? Now, in uh, from what I see in continental Europe, there may be more space for them. It will also counterbalance the Africans and the other Muslims who, who come across from uh, uh, other parts of the world. So that that may diffuse the situation there. But in UK, they are asking them to. Uh, accommodate 200,000 Ukrainians. Now the Brexit was all on the question of Eastern Europeans coming into UK, not a, not any, anything else. So then, having done the having gone for the Brexit and having won the uh, having won the referendum, on the question of uh, Eastern Europeans and others being there. Now, how is Boris Johnson administration going to accommodate 200,000 more Ukrainians? Thirdly, this is really an important time for us. Like 1989, 1990, everything depends on US. Everything depends on US voters, and it's it's a reflective time. If you look more inwards, I'm I'm sure one one item would be that our boys are not going to die fighting on foreign soil. So that immediately changes the picture, even for Taiwan, as as, as you mentioned. But the bigger issue for all of us is what is US going to do. And I don't think it is going to end with the midterm elections. President Biden is one term, so it means you run to 2024. So the chances of US reinventing itself is also pushed back by that much, because you will be into very very uh, divisive uh, issues in US. Yeah, I can <clears throat> definitely agree with that. Um, I think we have seen in terms of migration. Um, um, Something similar with different parameters at hand when we had the Syria crisis uh, in Europe with the migrating stream towards Germany, other countries in the European Union. What I see that is different right now is the constraints of inflation, and that could definitely have an impact on how um, that is going to be sustainable as a whole. And in terms of the involvement of the United States in a potential weaponized conflict uh, in Europe um, concerning what is going on in Ukraine, I see that as a very slim chance because um, just now um, the United States has scaled back out of regions like Afghanistan. And I don't see them uh, mobilizing anytime soon, especially when they are dealing with the powers of uh, inflation themselves internally, uh, trying to um, yeah do damage control um, within their domestic uh, borders. So I think um, this is going to be more and more an issue um, concerning the European countries. Um, it will definitely be translated into. Uh, this could be a result of uh, the foreign policy of this administration, um, but we will have to see how that plays out. But I think the the biggest uh, change, the biggest parameter that is different concerning uh, what I've seen in the past um, is that right now we have the constraints of inflation coming out of a uh, post-pandemic uh, yeah order. I would say yeah. Okay. And to, to uh, pick up pick up on uh, something that the Ranil that you had also mentioned um, um, that it all depends also on I think you put it in in the sense of it all depends on the U.S. voter and you know, what decisions that they're also going to make um, and this is always something where I might feel a little worried not just about the U.S. voter, but really about voters in, in general, because you have situations right now where the average voter may not be as informed on, on issues as, as they should be to begin with. So that's that's already a problem. It opens the opportunities, as we have seen in Europe and in the U.S., for populist politicians in the U.K., that matter as, as well. Um, so are the uncertainties that are now you know, being generated by these crises around the world, are they going to exacerbate this populist uh, shift? And uh, if that is the case, you know, that might be even more 
counterproductive. Uh, when it comes to refugees, for example, when we have seen uh, the, the rise of, of far-right extremist parties in, in many European countries as a result of, uh, um, Martin, what you had said, the, uh, the Syrian refugee crisis uh, back in sort of in 2015 and, and so on, or even uh, um, also from, from uh, Northern Africa, um, we see more populist rhetoric in the United States. Uh, we, are we seeing you know, renewed populist rhetoric potentially when these refugees from Ukraine are, are hitting you know, the, the shores of the U.S. or uh, going into other European countries that might now accommodate them? Uh, so that, that shift towards populism is something that has me a little worried about because if we rely on the, uh, the voter and uh, the usual guardrails of, uh, of democracy to keep that populist rhetoric in, in check. Uh, I think we have seen very sobering examples in Central Europe, whether that would be in, um, in Hungary, where arguably those guardrails are beginning to, to crumble if they haven't already crumbled, uh, with how Viktor Orban has sort of politicized uh, the debate about uh, about immigrants, um, and I could foresee that that's going to be more of a problem. Uh, we have seen the similar rhetoric in the U.S. when they talked about um, the, the caravans of, of refugees coming up from Central America uh, under the Trump administration. Um, so, are we? Is that uncertain? Or should we think about not just 2022, the election, but really, as um, as Ranil, I think you, you had mentioned. 2024 already, uh, because we're seeing that uh, the the debate is, is already unfolding. We have the former president weighing in. Well, on the if I had been in power, so this would not have happened. That can all be debated for sure. Uh, but I'm I'm more worried about, and I, I wonder how you would all feel about this. Whether or not these externalities are they going to just really exacerbate? the uncertainties within the country even more to the point where we see that populist shift. On the other note, and I'll close with that one, um, if the current administration is dealing with these foreign policy challenges and uncertainties, um, I think, uh, Abi, well, you, you might have been the one, if I remember, talking about sanctions. Um, so if we're not committed to, well, taking military action, which yeah would not be a... a a good proposition to begin with, unless it involves NATO countries being threatened. But if we rely on sanctions, and we have uh, announced punishing sanctions already, should we understand the consequences of those sanctions? Because what we're seeing right now is as a result of those sanctions, I think we might create another threat. And this might be one of those risks that we could actually maybe predict that we're pushing Russia closer and closer into the arms of, of China. And we have seen this in the, uh, in the run-up to the Olympic uh, Games in, in Beijing when President Xi Jinping and President Putin met, and they put out this really lengthy communique where, for lack of a better term, they essentially announced that they're more or less virtually in an alliance of sorts. So are these sanctions going to solidify that uh, alliance? Um, and you know what is that going to do to the U.S. position uh, in the world? Uh, is the U.S. electorate going to be even swayed by this, um, or because of uh, to come back to the problem of inflation that um, many of you have mentioned, are voters primarily looking at you know how these uncertainties are hitting them right here, right now, and that's where the buck stops? And they don't see the, the, the broader follow-on effect, which you can't really blame voters for, I guess, uh, because they're looking first and foremost, how is it going to affect, you know, um, you know, can I put food on the table? You know, but what are the gas prices and so on? Uh, is my job at stake? Um, but do we, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how you feel about that kind of expanding on uncertainty, the challenges that are coming down the pipeline. Yes, um, to a certain extent, this could actually happen. And with regards to um, the migration and maybe the instabilities that could occur from that, uh, we see that it is happening right now. For one, um, 
when we talk about the Syrian refugee uh, crisis um, in Denmark, for instance, where a lot of Syrians are uh, currently being stripped from their resident status in Denmark and are being asked to to to, to leave Denmark and go home. Um, this can potentially happen at a certain stage with um, the migration of refugees that we are seeing from the Ukraine um, in a couple of years from now. So that would be around the time frame of 2024. Um, so there's an expiration date on that. Um, yeah, hospitality, I would say, but it mostly um, has to do with also how countries are doing themselves. And and that's why I say inflation is a differentiator compared to other uh, situations that we have seen before, because when inflation is starting to hit, uh, people are tend to more concerned about their own livelihoods and what is going around in their own domestic borders. Uh, rather than what's going on abroad. And that's certainly going to be a dynamic um, within the U.S. Now, um, is this a breeding ground for populism in the U.S.? I cannot say with certainty if that's going to be the case, but I do see that um, uh, the regular U.S. American, um, U.S. citizen is not going to be too much concerned what is going around in, in Europe. It's too far away. It's not, um, you know, really relevant for them um, paying the bills and so on and so forth. So that's going to be a difficult challenge for the current administration to, to make that hard sell. Um, in terms of sanctions, I would definitely say that that's going to have a, um, a big impact, huge impact um, in the short term, um, because a lot of industries, especially automotive industries and uh, other um, industries that are intertwined with Russia are already experiencing uh, supply chain problems because of the um, sanctions, because of the um, dynamics that we are seeing in Russia and in the Ukraine. And that's only going to um, have a butterfly effect. And um, yeah, I do believe that uh, from this crisis, you will see uh, a stronger shift, not only from Russia to, to China, but also the other countries that are in the region. Uh, they are silent right now. They are not participating in this conflict, but they see what's happening. They see how uh, the Ukraine is um, being treated um, both by Russia, both by the EU and NATO. And they are going to take their lessons learned from uh, this experience and reflect that to themselves and might say, okay, maybe I should uh, shift more to the east and uh, back to uh, Moscow and even um, um, create a stronger alliance with uh, Beijing. Now, is that a bad thing for uh, the EU or for um, the United States? That remains to be seen, but um, we certainly will see um, that dynamic coming to fruition. Okay, thank you. Um, we have two minutes left, so maybe I'll, I'll allow each of you to uh, provide some closing remarks, if, if you will. We can go over a little bit. That's not going to be a problem for me, but keep it uh, as, as short as possible. Ideally, be about one minute, one and a half minutes at the most. Uh, Abi? Well, Francis, in closing, you know, I'd say rewind the clock back a couple of years, you know, who could have thought we're going to have a pandemic, you know, that's, that's going to have 444 million cases, 6 million deaths, record unemployment, 20 trillion, you know, in global bailout, bailouts so far and counting, um, you know, and, and then sort of the, the Russia Ukraine situation, you know, uh, that is evolving the way it has. So, you know, Charles Darwin said it best. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. So as it relates to uncertainty, I'd say, you know, expect the unexpected. And then, as Darwin says, you know, focus on adapting to that change. Well, Francis, I won't take too long, but I, I, I can't say what the voting patterns in U U.S. are going to be. But what I feel is this, that Ukraine is going to have an impact on the economy of the U.S., onto the voters. Inflation will go up. 
already there's one populist issue that's tied to the economy, the pandemic. <clears throat> then this also gets tied. That means populism will come in. The other issues that you have, they are not tied to the economy, whether it be the <coughs> immigrants, whether it be the attack on the capital, restriction of voting, transgender, Black Lives Matter are not connected. So there's a chance that uh, COVID, uh, Ukraine, plus uh, the economy can become a major factor and populism will be will benefit from that happens here. And even in Europe, for one example, I'll just give you a short of time. What are they going to do in Hungary as far as Oban is concerned? He'll take the refugees in if it helps him to win the elections. If he's not going to win the elections and his uh, hold on power is diluted, he won't have them in. So start with the country that's next to you. <clears throat> Martin, do you have any closing thoughts? Well, we came from a, uh, uh, a two-year-long um, pandemic um, that was uh, difficult to handle for most countries, uh, especially uh, in the U.S. There were a lot of losses. Um, we came out of it with uh, a lot of monetary policies. Um, unfortunately, these monetary policies, as economies are starting to pick up, are uh, now translating into higher inflation. Um, that can continue, and if it does, um, that is uh, going to be uh, a weak point for uh, the current administration um, going on um, forwards in the uh, in the election for 2022 and also um, for 2024. With the uh, Ukraine crisis and uh, its weaponized conflict with, with Russia, um, that's going to have a major impact on commodities. And that's kind of like the, uh, I would say, the, the fuse that uh, make uh, inflation even go go higher. And that, that trigger can be very dangerous. And I really agree that uh, globally speaking, uh, that will impact a lot of uh, countries and a lot of economies at scale. So if that continues and is not maintained, um, um, then that will be a breeding ground for um, yeah, certain politicians, especially in the United States. I would predict that um, President Trump would uh, make a return um, in U.S. politics uh, in some kind of shape or form and will definitely put a um, fingerprint on the 2024 election. That's definitely going to happen uh, without a doubt. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, all of your insights. It's. Uh, I wish we had a lot more time to delve into all those details. I think you all highlighted some very important uh, points that deserve a lot more consideration that we could give here. Uh, but hopefully that will lead to further discussions in, uh, in various circles, whether it's in, uh, you know, in political circles and business circles, uh, in, in academia, in, in the classroom, so that we educate voters. Um, but I think the way we could sum this up is that you know, uncertainty will always be there with us. Um, as obvious, you said, uh, expect the unexpected. Uncertainty will be a, the norm rather than the, the exception. Um, and so what can we do as a society, as individuals, to, uh, to brace for that, to, uh, to come out of uncertainties stronger? I think that's going to be uh, uh, one of the, uh, the important challenges for, for societies, for businesses, for, uh, for political leaders to, uh, to figure out. So on, on that note... I thank you all very much for, uh, for joining us on, on this panel. Uh, thank you for your thoughts, and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope we see you in Colombo in just three and a half hours. Yes, yes. Yeah. Look forward to Thank you very much.